Okrima Media's Polity Amtabi Shomulikai, Wood Party leader Patricia DeLille, joins me to unpack the party's manifesto ahead of what is being called South Africa's most important election since democracy. So the Good Party proposes as solution to existing poverty and to support the millions of unemployed people a basic income grant of 999 rand per month. How will the government afford this and how will it be implemented? Our manifesto is a recipe to rebalance our society and rebalance it in a way that more people can is the fruits of our democracy. Uh, we ac also acknowledge that a lot of things have changed over the past 30 years because it's dishonest to say things have not changed. And then, of course, we looked at uh, the, the latest census results by the statistician general. And for me, who has got a history of fighting in the struggle for liberation and for democracy, I can relate to that, but in a rebalancing our society uh, where you find that the majority of our people, at least 80%, um, are, are suffering uh, for various reasons. They are suffering because they can't put a decent meal on the table. They're suffering because they don't have a job. And we are saying, as caring South Africans, we should all feel for the majority of our brothers and sisters. And therefore, we need to look at measures that can bring relief to the majority of suffering South Africans. People are suffering, and I can tell you now, Tabi, that it's not that people want grants. People want to work. But while we are sorting out the economy, they also need to survive. So you can't punish them because the economy is not growing. You have to do both. And therefore, we have uh, engaged the services of an economist, of a finance person, to look at the affordability of a basic income grant. We also look at many other countries in the world where they have implemented the universal basic income grant that the definitely reduction of poverty in those countries. And so let me start with uh, affordability. First of all, if you ask me, where do you think you're going to get the money from? We understand that our fiscus is in a very bad space. We understand that we have got a massive debt to service. Of, of mismanagement over the years of bailing out SOEs. We understand all of that. And we look at the poverty uh, uh, data line. And currently, the 350 rand that was introduced during COVID is half of what you need to survive on a daily basis for a family. And then we said, we must uh, start a campaign, which we started two years ago, uh, to, to advocate for an increase to the social distress of relief grant. Where must the money come from? First of all, corruption steals directly from poor people. And therefore, we need to do more about stopping corruption in our country. At least 500 billion rand gets stolen over a period of two to three years every year. And that money could be used uh, to further help those suffering majority that, that can't put food on their table. We also look at what is the income of, uh, of our country. And we receive, for instance, millions and billions of rands on royalties from all our gold mines and all the mineral resources that we have. We say that we can take a percentage of that money, which is meant for the royalties of all of us, and, and move it towards a basic income grant. Then there is another pot of money where all the criminal assets and money 
that is recovered by the state, by the SIU, by the S4 feature unit, it's called the CARA Act, proceeds from criminal proceedings, that we can also put some of that towards that point. But then lastly, we are saying that nothing is going to change on the 1st of June, 2024. Because you, all the parties come with their manifesto, that is their plan. Some of them come with strategies how to achieve it. But structure follow function. And if you look at the current structure of government at all three spheres of government, we say it must be the structure must be reviewed, it must be transformed. And how do you do that? More than four years ago, the finance minister Tito Mboweni said that all government departments and all three spheres of government must go back to zero based budgeting. Get back to the basics. Because what happened over the 30 years, every year with a budget. You just add on CPI and you add on inflation. And so, therefore, you've got this bloated budget. So, if we say if we can start doing zero-based budgeting, we will be able to also free up uh, more resources. But the last point on the basic income grant, we said as good, let us test the idea of, of 999 rand uh, per month to a family. We took 50,000 rand of our own funding. And we started in three provinces, in Gauteng, the Eastern Cape, and the Western Cape. And we said to some of our supporters and just people in the community, if we give you 1,000 rand, what business can you start to generate more for yourself? And we gave them the 1,000 rand per person. And in some instances, an old lady in a block of flats uh, bought some socks and started selling the socks. Um, and we helped them to go and procure it. In some instances, some ladies bought, um, and we see the woman doing much better than the male counterpart. They will buy these chemicals to make a soap, to make dishwasher and things like that. Uh, buying small bottles and selling that. And then they, they're doing very well because they sell it to the same community that they live in for half the price, sometimes more than half. Just a few weeks ago in Kabeja, we came across an unemployed welder and we said, what do you need? He said he need to buy some steel and some welding material. He's got a welding machine. Uh, we gave him the thousand rand and he started buying some more steels and making burglar bars. So we feel that this is a very good story and we're very happy with what we have seen can be done with this thousand rand. And we think that if government can upscale that, uh, you can see a lot more micro entrepreneurs that can make a living for themselves. So that is why, you know, we feel very strongly that um, one thing that we cannot do, we cannot afford not to look after the majority of people that are suffering in our country at the moment. And economic growth means more economic activity and money circulating in the economy and therefore yeah. more job opportunities. So how will good grow the economy in a way that will uplift everyone? You know, fortunately, I've had the experience of being the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure. And infrastructure department never existed before in our democracy. And one of the tasks that President Ramaphosa gave me was to go and start it from scratch. Uh, because he said that uh, infrastructure is the flywheel of the economy. So my first task was to go and establish an infrastructure department. But at the same time, I also had to develop an infrastructure investment plan and also go and raise funding to fund some of the projects from the private sector and get that crowding in effect from the private sector. But we also brought in methodologies like build, own, operate and transfer uh, 
uh, public-private partnerships. So I come with that experience of having tested the impact of infrastructure development. So that is with the help of the private sector and government. But government has also got many public employment programs. You know, the EPWP, uh, the Community Works Program, many poverty alleviation programs. And we need to assess all of those programs and see what is their impact and see how we can transform them to create even more jobs. So we are, are saying that we need to have an urban development management program whereby we assist and we train young people in programs to, to fix all the water leaks in our country. 40% of our water is leaked away. You train them to become plumbers. Um, then also with cleaning up our cities and towns, the riverbanks, you know, there are a lot of alien plants in our rivers that could be cleaned up. And that will be a government's contribution towards a job creation. And the Presidential Public Employment Program has been very successful. It's created over 1.8 million jobs. And again, we are proposing how that can be scaled up. Also in the economy, the biggest hurdle for us is load shedding. We are not saying that we are going to stop load shedding. But what we are saying is that we need to face in a renewable energy so that renewable energy can start replacing the coal and the fossil fuel energy. But we can't just stop fossil fuels and coal mines completely. There are millions of people that will be affected by that. That's why we're supporting the just transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy. But considering the impact on our communities, a reskill them, um, and making sure that we create more jobs in the renewable space. And as we can see already, in partnership with the private sector, we are beginning to turn the tide. But until such time that we don't get the balance right between renewable and fossil fuel, and 90% of our fossil fuel still comes from coal, we need to agree to phase it out over a period of two years. And those fossil fuel electricity generators, the coal ones, once they've come to the end of their lifespan, we should not renew it because that is exactly the problem that we are sitting with. All the coal power stations are past their lifespan. And so they break down and you need to spend a lot of money on, 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 on maintenance. So if we can balance out the, the, the load shedding, it can also help the economy. But in terms of small, medium enterprises, the informal sector. We do need to do more to grow that informal sector. You know, I'm now the Minister of Tourism. And if you look at the millions of people that can be employed in tourism, because about 80% of our unemployed people are semi-skilled and unskilled. And in tourism, the opportunities, it's there to train them. So in that way, you also build an inclusive um, economy and you make sure that especially young people get in. But our young people must be trained to provide the skills that's needed in the economy. So we need to project 10, 15 years ahead, what will be the skills needed in the economy? And currently we've got that mismatch. We're not producing the skills that are needed in the economy. So we're also proposing that even NASPES and all the help that government is giving uh, to TVT colleges, that we need to begin to direct our young people into a direction where uh, they can fill the vacuum of particular skills within the economy. So that's, that's shortly what our plan is all about. Uh, to grow the economy.
And Patricia, earlier on you spoke about corruption. So what systems should government put in place to prevent and detect corruption in government? That is our biggest challenge. You know, we spend a lot of money on commissions afterwards to find out what went wrong. Like we spend a billion rand on the Zonda Commission and many other commissions before that to find out what went wrong. We are saying as government, we must invest more money to improve the systems within government so that the systems in government can detect and prevent corruption instead of spending that money after the, uh, the, the, the event. And, and, and in both ministries where, where, where I've been working was to look at those systems. I think especially where government can deal with corruption is that in the supply chain management chain, that is where all the corruption is taking place. So you advertise for a tender, then it goes to a bid evaluation committee, then it goes to a bid adjudication committee. And in that value chain is where the corruption is taking place. So we need to make use of technology. We need to start using blockchain. With the blockchain technology, you'll be able to detect every transaction that's taking place. Government must also do more to save, to get value for money. You know, Tabi, it is so bad that if you can buy a glass for two rand in a shop, government will pay 102 rand for the same glass. So there's a lot of corruption in the supply chain management system. Uh, we need to have an independent person that can do due diligence on the whole process from beginning to end. So corruption steals directly from the poor because sometimes, you know, there's what they call in government, they call shopping. So people in the department know there's a tender going to come out to build uh, a dam or to put up solar panels. So they know the tender's coming. They know parliament has approved the budget. And then they go out and they go shopping for companies that will get the tender and so that they can get commission from that company. So it's predetermined upfront who is going to get the tender. And the one get getting the tender also agrees to the inflated prices for government because now that contractor must pay commission to the official. So really, if we can sort out with technology, our supply chain management process, we can save the taxpayers a lot of money. And your party has announced you as its candidate for Western Cape Premier, expressing confidence in your leadership. So what changes can we expect from you if you are elected as Premier? You know, Tabi, I've got the experience. I've, I've served for eight years as the, uh, the mayor of the city of Cape Town. I've also served in provincial government as an MEC for social development. And I've got the experience now at, at national level. So it's based on that experience that people have selected me, but also my track record in where I have served in government. Uh, and I hate talking about myself, but, you know, in the city of Cape Town, I got four consecutive clean audits that I didn't feel is an achievement for me because there's a moral obligation for us to, to look after the taxpayers' money. Uh, in public works, I've saved the government millions of rand by looking at all of those fraudulent leases, at least 253 million a year. When I came to, to tourism, the first thing that landed on my desk was the Tottenham Hotspurs. Uh, one billion rand. And within two weeks, I dissolved the board, I stopped the deal and saved South Africa one billion. So there are some good examples where government can work, but it depends on the leadership. So here in the Western Cape, uh, not only do, do I live here, but I, I know the circumstances. 
the further you go out of the city, the more you see the peri-urban and the rural areas. You can see the differences as if 1994s never arrived in those towns. We continue, not only in towns and cities, but we continue to take people further away from uh, job opportunities. We continue with the apartheid spatial planning. Uh, people spend more than 40%. And here in the Western Cape, it is terrible how I continue to see how people are dumped far away from job opportunities. So our plan is that we will bring people back towards uh, uh, job opportunities, back to where the factories are, back to where in the central business district. That's why when I was the mayor of the city of Cape Town, I released over 16 pieces of land in the city center and within a three, four, five kilometer radius. And that was my big fallout with the Democratic Alliance. They didn't like that. So I think that if we do that, we will not only integrate our communities, but we will also bring social cohesion if we deal with apartheid spatial planning. Then, of course, what everybody around the country is suffering with is the issue of the affordability of basic services, water, sanitation, and electricity. Here in the city of Cape Town, the NERSA approved a 16% increase. But for the past two years, here in the city of Cape Town, we've been paying 18%. If you look at the draft budget of all municipalities, today you are paying uh, a, a, a two rand 80 for one electricity unit. Here's the budget that they are going to approve. The budget is going to increase that 2 rand 80 to 4 rand 20. So I said, fine, here's the proof. I'm not sucking things out of my thumb. So April, you're paying 280. In May, you're going to vote for the same people. On the 1st of July, this is what you are going to pay. So we have been fighting these increases of basic services. Because the one thing is that, according to census, millions of people have got access to electricity, 92%. But now you can't afford it. So, so we are also driving a massive campaign around the unaffordability of basic services. And then also two years ago, we started the campaign against gender-based violence and femicide. Uh, we've invested more than 300,000 rand in that campaign because I said that the fight must be every day, 365 days a year. And we have reached about 12 million women to help, and help some of them to get out of GBV. If, and where gender-based violence is taking place within our party, we act immediately. Because the gender-based violence and violence in general in our communities, um, in the Western Cape, it is... Uh, it's not getting the necessary attention. But we have got a plan on other issues like agriculture, like, uh, you know, growing the economy. And of course, uh, tourism is, is also very big in, in the Western Cape. And despite a late start, Good received enough support in the 2019 elections to win two seats in the National Assembly and enter the Western Cape Provincial Legislature. So, Patricia, how much support is the party aiming for in this year's elections? So, with 2019, we started four months before the elections. We've got three seats. Uh, 22 new parties participated in the elections and only two made it to parliament. We were one of them. We continue to work and grow the party. And in 2021, we participated in uh, 44 municipalities, not the whole country. And we currently have 51 councillors in four different provinces. So we continue to grow. So we know that if we, we are, we've got two seats in, in the National Assembly, we will be happy if we can push that up between five and seven or ten.
Um, then in terms of the provincial legislatures, we now had more time to work in Gauteng, the Northern Cape, uh, the Eastern Cape, the Western Cape. Uh, also, we've got some presence now in Pumalanga and also in the Free State. Uh, we're still very thin on the ground in Limpopo. But because we are a party that's work in progress, uh, we are prepared to work even harder to get more seats now. And there seems to be an emerging consensus that there will be no outright winner of the 2024 yes. national and provincial elections. So should yeah. good form part of a coalition government, what policies and principles will the party be looking for from other parties? You know, I see a lot of new political parties uh, with unelected leaders by their structures, because that is where you need to start if you start a political party, get elected by your structures. Now, we've done that. Last year, November, the, the National Conference of Good took a resolution to say that we accept that coalitions is the future of uh, our country. That coalition comes about when no party received a 50% plus one, because it's prescribed in law that you need 50% plus one to form a government to govern. So we got a mandate from our conference that says that we can enter into discussions with any political party after the elections to get that 50% plus one. But then we need to report back to our national executive committee that will take the final decision. And that's why we are not talking about coalitions before the election. Uh, I put my faith in the voters of this country. They're not stupid. You can never take them for granted. If they push us into a direction where no party gets 50% plus one, our democracy is maturing. So, so we, we will definitely participate in coalition talks, yes. And you serve in President Sarah Ramaphosa's cabinet as a minister, even though you are not a member of the ruling party. So do you think it will be easier for good to participate in the coalition with the ANC if the ANC falls short of a 50% uh, majority. Since our late President Nelson Mandela started a culture in this country where in every cabinet since 1994, the ANC included a member of the opposition. It started with F.W. De Clare, and then it was the late Prince Butelezi, uh, then it was Dr. Mangena from Azapu. Uh, then it was the Freedom Front Plus. Uh, then it was the National Freedom Party. So this is nothing new. I am not the first opposition leader serving in an ANC cabinet. Now, your question is that when you are serving the people of South Africa, you get a budget to do so. And that money doesn't belong to the ANC or to me. It belongs to the taxpayers. So. If, like uh, the many of the polls, and let me tell you, I don't even read those polls uh, with due respect to them, uh, that, uh, yes, the ANC might get below 50%. It will be the responsibility of the majority party in a coalition situation to reach out to other political parties to get that magic 50% plus one. So we have not decided up front. What you see with the multi-party charter is that they have come together and say, afterwards, this is what we will do. But that is not the wishes of, of, of the voters. And also, it is expressed on a basis of, of almost hatred. Um, and, you know, we come from a history of hatred. I don't see other political parties as being the enemy. I see them as being opponents of each other. So we really open. It's up for the ANC to decide. I think that if they get under 50%, they will still be the majority, and then they can decide who they want to invite to govern with them. Thank you. That was Patricia DeLille speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about the party's manifesto.